Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming, uh, in spite of this uh, inclement weather and unexpected in Washington. Um, I am Horacio Terraza. I am the coordinator of the uh, Emerging and Sustainable Cities Initiative for the infrastructure sector. And uh, we want to start right now the, the panel. I'm going to introduce Gustavo Arnabat, who is the executive director of the U.S. here at the bank. So, Gustavo, please. Thank you. Good morning to all. As I said, I am Gustavo Arnabat. I represent the United States on the board of executive directors of the IDB. And I want to welcome you to this uh, discussion uh, and to the launch of the America's Quarterly Winter 2014 edition, which focuses on sustainable cities. Uh, with over 17,000 readers, including key policymakers and leaders in the world of finance, business, politics, the media, and the academy, the America's Quarterly, the policy journal of our hemisphere, is the only magazine dedicated to policy analysis and debate of economics, finance, social development, and politics in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, its founder uh, and editor-in-chief uh, is with us today. We'll be heading up the, uh, the panel, uh, Chris Sabatini, who's also director of policy for the America Society uh, Council of the Americas. Uh, the Americas uh, Quarterly is published uh, by the America Society Council of the Americas um, and uh, we have been partnering up, the IDB has since 2007, on important initiatives having to do with uh, energy uh, in the region, and we're delighted to team up again for this event. And before proceeding, I also want to thank uh, Pablo Bachelet, uh, the IDB's Office of External Relations, for agreeing to coordinate this, uh, this event. Uh, the IDB launched an initiative uh, headed by Elise Juan uh, several years ago to promote uh, sustainable cities. Uh, Eighty percent of the population of, of this hemisphere lives in cities. Uh, the United Nations predicts by the year 2050, 9 in 10 Latin Americans will live in urban areas. Uh, today, 111 million people in the region live in precarious conditions in urban shanty towns, segregated socially, socially and spatially, with limited access to basic services, jobs, and transportation. Rising energy costs and poorly managed growth in urban sprawl have hurt, have, have put a strain on the environment and led to disconnected governance. Uh, this edition of the America's Quarterly and today's panel asks several important questions. How are cities adapting to climate change, uh, improving livability, and becoming more socially integrated? Integration of technology is making cities more efficient and competitive in the, margin, in the emerging marketplace of intellectual capital. And U.S. cities, in particular, are leading the way in the movement towards smart cities. The push to incorporate technology in all aspects of, of city infrastructure is rapidly gaining momentum. In 2012, expenditures in the global uh, smart city technology market were valued at slightly over $6 billion. And it's estimated that the year 2020, uh, they, will be, uh, they will grow to a little over $20 billion. Now, some cities uh, that are leading the way are Seattle, uh, which offers more than 1,000 open data sets for transparency and supports the growth of startups and mobile apps to improve mobility and quality of life. Here in Washington, D.C., which has launched gradedc.gov uh, to mine social media to monitor resident complaints and concerns and direct them to the appropriate mun municipal agency. And Portland, uh, a leader in the use of information communication technology solutions to create real-time traffic signal timing adjustments that support smart mobility. The application of smart city technologies are not only making municipalities more efficient, but have also been proven to be engines of economic growth. Adaptation of ICT solutions have led to the development of creative and highly, of a creative and highly educated workforce. As leading urban economists have highlighted in several studies, the most rapid urban growth has been achieved in cities where a high share of an educated labor force is available. And U.S.-based companies such as IBM, Cisco, Oracle, and GE are among leading suppliers of smart city technologies using innovation to create smart apps to improve city management throughout the region. Now, cities grow in economic and political prominence. They face great strains under existing fiscal structures. Detroit's recent high-profile bankruptcy filing highlights the challenges that many urban centers face. How do cities continue to recover from the global economic crises while facing smaller tax bases and higher maintenance, health, and pension costs? Investment in smart city technologies is boosting public sector productivity while simplifying processes to develop new businesses within cities. Uh, the integration and delivery and procedures of public services has removed many administrative uh, burdens while scaling up critical sustainable infrastructure. 
Uh, cities are also realizing that in order to address global challenges, they cannot wait on national or state governments to take the lead. Uh, to be sure, um, I don't envision that we will return to a pre-Treaty of Westphalia world where city-states dominate the economic and political landscape. But cities and their champions are working together to develop targeted, meaningful actions that create impact on the ground. I'll just give you a few examples. The U.S. has led the development of important regional and international city networks. One such effort is the group of, of, of C40 cities. The C40 group um, has forged bipartisan efforts to create sustainable actions throughout the world to combat climate change. The Rockefeller Foundation has launched the Resilient Cities Challenge to help cities better address increasing shocks and stresses, providing technical support and resources to develop and implement plans for urban resilience. As early as 1997, uh, Chicago Mayor Richard Daley brought together 10 municipalities under the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, which has grown to over 270 mayors and has made important strides in economic development and affordable housing in the region. Recently, 10 uh, mayors, uh, major U.S. cities, announced a united effort to significantly boost energy efficiency in their buildings. This is the, uh, the City Energy Project. This initiative uh, well, could lower the energy bills for, uh, by nearly a billion dollars annually uh, and cut five to seven million tons of carbon emissions annually. And as, 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 as President Obama uh, stated uh, recently in the U.S. Mayor's Conference um, in January, which, which was held here in this city, the work done in cities can transform communities block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. You can see the resilience and strength of people and the incredible vibrancy that cities bring, not just to those who live within the boundaries of cities but entire regions. I'm certain that there are lessons to be drawn from the experiences of U.S. cities that can be directly applied to cities throughout the rest of this hemisphere. And just, and, and, and also I'm certain that there are, that we in the United States uh, can stand to gain from the experiences and experimentation that's occurring in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, it is appropriate then uh, that the launching of the current edition of America's Quarterly is taking place at this institution which is dedicated to promote to the promotion of economic and social development in the Americas. So welcome again and join me in welcoming Chris Sabatini and congratulating him on this new edition. Thank you, Gustavo. Let me say, first of all, um, this is Gustavo's last day as executive director uh, of the IDB, so I'm honored and proud that uh, he chose to spend part of it with him, with us, instead of cleaning out his desk drawers, um, which you'll have to do later. But uh, yeah, but thank you for coming. And uh, he's now spoken at two AQ launch events, and I promise you, Gustavo, even when you're not here, we'll still invite you to speak at AQ launch events. You're always welcome, and thank you for your support, and thank you for your time uh, here at the IDB. Um, let me explain a little bit why we chose to do this, first of all. <clears throat> I edited a magazine. Uh, it comes out uh, four times a year. Uh, unfortunately, I named it America's Quarterly, so I'm bound to that. Uh, it's not <laughs> what I wanted. If I had known how much work it would be, I would have named it something like America's whenever I feel like it. Um, but it is quarterly. So every three months, I have to come up with a new topic. And uh, this topic was proposed by a colleague then, uh, who's here, Andrina Sejas. Uh, she basically came to me and said, you know what, there's this idea of sustainable cities. It's really catching on. It's very important. It's being adopted and pursued by the IDB. Um, why don't we dedicate an issue to that? I was skeptical at first, uh, in part because it sort of felt to me slightly like a development trend. Um, which I had seen a lot of come and go uh, throughout the years. But as we started to get into it, I began to realize the richness of it, the importance of it. Um, and we pulled together, uh, because of that, I think a very multi-dimensional issue that looks at the importance of it in terms of the environment, in terms of transportation, in terms of climate uh, and energy efficiency, and in terms of social inclusion, all things that we have dealt with in previous issues. So I think the issue came together very well. But we also had the benefit of the IDB's really innovative projects uh, and staff in this area, which wrote for us. Horacio wrote uh, an article on water management, and Elise Juan wrote an article, which really is in many ways leading the way uh, both in the region and globally uh, when we think about sustainable cities. Um, Andrina then later left and came here to work, so the <laughs> IDB stole her, but I, I don't hold that against you. Um, but good, good job. The, um, but what I will say is, is when we started to look at it, and you need to only travel in Latin America now to realize that really cities is where the action's at when it comes to development. Um, as Gustavo mentioned, 80% of, 
citizens in the Americas live in urban areas. But it's also where the action's happening in terms of innovation, in terms of programs like in Curitiba, where the poor turn in recycled goods and get food in return, in terms of transportation innovations like the BRT that we saw in Bogota and Curitiba and Santiago and elsewhere, the creation and uh, expansion of bike lanes, not just in uh, the US, but also in uh, Argentina, in Mexico City, and because of an entrepreneurial Mexican, Mexico City mayor, Marcelo Ebrard, we're now looking at what was once one of the most polluted cities in the world, has completely turned the corner and has now become one of the greener cities, though it has a far way to go, um, has made a series of very important adaptations. That's why I was excited about the issue. Um, and you need only to travel to Latin America to see and experience how this has changed in terms of social inclusion, in terms of green space, in terms of improving the livability uh, for the majority of citizens uh, in the region. And it's an interesting change because when you think about Latin America and discussion about Latin America in the 50s and 60s, people were talking about rural development. People were talking about land redistribution. Now suddenly people are talking about urban reform, architecture, policy reform, politics, and inclusion as it affects their daily lives and interactions with their elected authorities. So needless to say, I'm very happy with the issue. Uh, technology, as we talk about here, we'll talk about on the panel, <coughs> Is, a, um, is clearly a key component. And we did a special section uh, on apps. Uh, Gustavo mentioned that there's a whole host of uh, apps that are available that do everything from allow you to track traffic, to call your cab, to find where your local bike is for a bike share program and the like. So we'll talk a little bit about that now. What I'm gonna do is try to organize a conversation among our four panelists here. You all have their bios. I won't uh, bother reading them to you. Since it's a magazine launch, I believe we're probably all literate. I don't need to read you. Um, the, um, so what I'll do <clears throat> is we'll talk uh, first about the concept. Uh, Michael Sorkin uh, is an architect, an urban planner. Uh, he's, with, uh, uh, he's with CUNY, but he has a long history in working with us and has a very good article on this. And I'll start with uh, Michael, you first. Um, what does, <laughs> explain the concept of sustainable cities. What does it mean? Um, it's a nice term. Explain a little the dimensions. Get your mic, the far left, red button, there you go. Yes? Ah, okay. I think, I think we all have the general Al Gorean notion of what it means to be sustainable, which is simply to um, uh, replace the resources we use such that there will be sufficient uh, available for future generations. This is a very simple concept. Um, we talk about sustainability in um, regard to cities uh, because that's where people live. Um, this is the year or the, 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 the year in which China passed 50 uh, percent urbanization en route to 80 percent, the, the number just cited. Um, already half the people in the world live in cities, uh, and half of those live in slums. Um, so it's a, it is an urban question perforce because we're an urban planet now. Um, sustainability is obviously also a question of resources. Um, I make some reference in my article to this idea of the so-called ecological footprint. Is that something we're all conversant with nowadays? Yeah. So the ecological footprint, as, as you know, is, is, a, is, is, a, is, a, is a representation, uh, a way of measuring the rate at which we consume resources. So by a variety of algorithms, and these were developed by a couple of nice Canadian guys, um, you can calculate um, what area of the Earth's surface um, was required to provide your necktie or eyeglasses or a slice of pineapple for breakfast. Um, it's a little bit of a crude measure because it converts everything into a single value, the value of area. Nevertheless, um, when you apply these measurements uh, to a, a variety of conditions, you can get shocking results. So for example, um, one shocking result is the calculation. Um, and uh, by various algorithms, this comes out somewhere uh, in this neighborhood. Um, if everybody on the planet were to consume at the rate at which, um, uh, what's the term of art? North Americans? Gringos? Uh, <laughs> gringos do. Um, we would today require the surface area of an additional four planets in order to support the population of the planet at the rates at which we consume. Um, so there is obviously a crisis of resources. And when you have a crisis of resources um, uh, that's begged by the question of disproportionate consumption by one uh, sector of the, the by, by us, we members of the 1%, 
Um, then there is a crisis of equity. So to speak about sustainability without talking about equity and environmental justice, I think is to miss a, a, a key piece of the point. Um, and to um, neglect to look at the area in which solutions come, um, which are distributive um, rather than technological. I mean, we're, we're a little bit overly infatuated with um, technological solutions to what are, in fact, social and economic problems. So I'll be, although I'm um, in love, uh, as in love with technology as the next architect, um, I, I think that that's where the, the conversation should go. Um, do I have another two minutes? Yeah, just preserve. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the, the question then is, um, how, how do we take responsibility for, for these problems both of resources and equity, and at what level? And I, I would argue, um, you know, never mind the Treaty of Westphalia, um, that the, 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 the city is the logical increment of um, uh, resistance and organization um, on a planet in which nation states continue to demonstrate their incompetence to deal with these problems. Uh, and in which um, predatory multinationals tend to exacerbate them. So I, I, am, I am all for the Hanseatic League myself. Um, I think that in terms of democratic organization um, and in the organization of resources, if we are going to take responsibility for our footprint, for our impact on, planet, on the planet, we have to do it in a democratic way, um, and we have to do it at a scale that makes sense, that is organizable, tractable, and logical. And for me, that's the city. Let me say, we'll go back to you, but in, in his article, Michael uh, presents a uh, sort of a, a fantasy design of what New York City would look like if it were fully sustainable, self-sustaining, everything from food to energy. Uh, when we first talked about it, Andrina and I were thinking, wow, that's crazy. But it actually is a good template for imagining what the implications yeah, of Yeah, let me just introduce that word. I mean, it's at, 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 the, at the margin of the conversation of sustainability, um, the word self-sufficiency has to, has to be introduced, which we do in this Perfect. project. At least Juan directs um, the, uh, sent the office here dedicated to sustainable cities. Um, started with an action plan for 50 mid-sized emerging cities. Um, at least explain a little bit how this translates into the work of the IDB and what you've been doing and how you define that work. Well, in, in a more shorter version for us, uh, a sustainable city is a city that can provide a, a decent quality of life while at the same time preserving uh, physical and environmental assets for future generations, no? And so we built a program around three dimensions, uh, the environmental and climate change sustainability, where you have all your indicators of you know, solid waste, water, sanitation, renewables, and so on. Uh, urban sustainability, where you have all your indicators of um, <clears throat> urban planning, uh, use of land, uh, provision of public services, mobility, uh, connectivity, which is becoming more and more important. And a third one, uh, not the least important, which is fiscal sustainability. And this is one of the major challenges we have in, in, in our cities. Our inter the program, by the way, is focused on intermediate cities, which is, as, as, as Chris said, mentioned, where the growth is. And the fiscal is, is a real challenge because in Latin America, we've been very successful. Our political decentralization and you know, governors and mayors are important figures in the political day-to-day -day of a country. Sometimes they become even presidents, but a fiscal decentralization has gone at a, at a more slower pace, no? And that difference creates a lot of tension uh, that translates into, you know, cities not being able to finance uh, their investments in sustainability. Uh, we see the role of the bank here as, as a role. Uh, first, uh, we like to learn what this challenge means and implies. Uh, as, as Michael put it, is, this is probably the challenge that the that, uh, world is facing in, in, in the next uh, years, uh, and it blends uh, with climate change uh, and so many other things, political concepts and so on. No? Uh, second is to try to, once we learn, translate that into a program where we can really provide assistance uh, to, to local governments, uh, to our clients, no? and be useful to them. And then uh, later on, probably uh, trying to lead the process with them and eventually mobilizing the needed financing which is probably where the Achilles heel of the program is, no? Not just our financing, but financing from other sources, as well as private sector. Uh, perhaps just to, to complete the, here, uh, a word on the, on, on the political side that Michael him. It, one of the things we are learning and that might provide uh, perhaps a, a gleam of hope uh, into you know, how cities are gonna be dealing with this 
is more and more uh, when we deal with the city, we have a part of a program that deals with a, a, a citizen monitoring program, no? And we help them build an observatory uh, which we link to the local university and so on. We are seeing this more and more as, as participation, active participation from, from the community uh, as a way perhaps to preserve the kind of things we mention and we recommend in the action plan. And then trying to link this with the other concept of technology and smart cities, we believe that as cities develop and are able to use more technology, and this technology is, is provided to citizens, citizens will be almost online uh, intervening in public policy at the city level, no? In trying to make things better. Let me just ask a follow-up question. <clears throat> in, you have a whole diagnostic that you do in these cities that involves talking to citizens, involves talking to policymakers, but also obviously with your team of, of uh, technocrats here. Um, give me a sense of what some of the priorities have been as they've emerged out of uh, specific cities, um, both the demands that you've heard from citizens as well as sort of the priorities from the policymakers and, and your own analysis. Uh, I'll illustrate it with, with an example that I think will help <coughs> perhaps communicate better. <clears throat> La Paz in Baja California is one of the cities of our program. Uh, uh, La Paz is, is a coastal city uh, at the end of Baja California, which is a desert area. Has a vocation of you know, tourism, services, and, and probably environment, because it really sits uh, as a sentinel of one of the largest marine biospheres in the world, the Sea of Cortez. And in the diagnosis, uh, mobility was one of the issues. Uh, you know, uh, this is one of the Mexican cities that has the highest uh, coefficient of cars per families, no? And the reason is that there's a public policy that, you know, you can buy used cars in the United States and bring them there at no cost and no customs, no? Well, anyway, uh, we're working now on the mobility study, and, and one of the issues that is arising is probably one of the most important environmental assets that this city has is its coastline. It's a beautiful coastline, it's a malecon, you know, with the uh, bike routes and this and that and the other. There is this project of a private consortium that wants to convert that into a high-speed highway of four to six lanes and build buildings up to 20 stories floor. No? Obviously, the mobility story is saying that is crazy. There are so many other ways of doing this. No? So on June 5th, uh, we have um, a meeting at, uh, with the city council to present the results of the mobility. The private sector guys will be there, of course, and so will be society as well. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a huge, uh, <clears throat> it's a huge um, stake, you know, that, that we're taking. But we believe that uh, there's something to be said there and there's something for society to say that, you know, they should preserve this environmental asset and not build, you know, a four to six lane speedway in front of the coastline. So it's not growth at any cost. Um, I was with uh, the World Bank. Give us a sense. I know you've worked on urban development for a while. How is this different? Explain a little bit what the World Bank's doing on this uh, field outside the region. Yeah, this one. Thanks, Chris. Actually, I think that both um, Ellis and Michael have, you know, really framed the issues really well. So within that, I wanted to talk about how the World Bank is responding to, you know, the emerging sort of um, the nexus of the energy crisis, the water crisis, and the food crisis, which is really framed with this rapid urbanization. So with the 2010 urban strategy that the World Bank came out with, we thought about, you know, today we know that, you know, 50% of the world is already urban. By 2030, we would have another 3 billion people moving into cities. And, you know, the paradigm was already changing that um, cities were, were not um, sort of the, uh, the, 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 the centers of problems and density was not the center of problems, that, you know, the world's heart didn't sort of dwell in rural areas, that actually cities were engines of economic growth. But at the same time, you know, while 75% of GDP was coming out from cities, we also knew that, you know, two-thirds of GHG emissions were part of the city's contribution, or, you know, two-thirds of the energy um, consumption was in cities. So looking at that and seeing where this urbanization trajectory is going and that cities are going to, it is inevitable that cities are going to urbanize and 90% of this urbanization is going to take place in, in Asia and in Africa. We started to, in a way, connect the dots and look at, you know, how do we see urban planning, urban transport, <coughs> the services like sewerage and water and sanitation 
becoming um, sustainable, uh, very much within the definition that Alison and, and Michael gave. But beyond that, not only looking at cities um, and the systems that they have and how do they interconnect and how do we bring them together, but also in a country should we not be looking at cities as a system of cities. So not, let's not just focus on the metropolitan big cities, but the emerging cities, the secondary cities, and see what roles they play. And the fact that if most of the rural population is moving into secondary cities, because that's where a whole lot of economic activity is moving out from large cities like manufacturing, where it becomes quite unsustainable for large cities due to land prices and congestion to actually house manufacturing. If these are moving into secondary cities, what can we do today to make sure that we're not going into urban sprawl, that we are providing for the, for the populations coming in, that we're looking at affordable housing and at rental housing so that half of the world does not live in slums as it does today. So that, that actually became our focus. And within that framework, then, the idea was to look at how do we help cities grow sustainable um, in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of transit-oriented development, compactness, and density, uh, but also very much in terms of inclusion. Because for us, you know, anything sustainable has to be equitable, inclusive, and green. So we're looking at a broader spectrum, just, just, just as you are. And within this, we feel that, you know, we talked about technology, and we thought, how do we bring innovation into it? And, and we didn't want to think of technology, you know, just as gadgets or sensors for parking cars and so on. But how do we include it in terms of um, planning cities? How do we make you know, um, interagency coordination possible in cities? So if you're putting down a road, you're also thinking of, are you, you know, capturing land value? Are you putting in housing there? Are you bringing in BRT? Are you putting down cycle lanes and so on? So getting an interagency institutional coordination going, but also making sure that citizens have a voice. So it is giving that access and opportunity and what technology makes possible, you know, with 60% um, percentage penetration of mobile telephony, is that citizens can actually give feedback. They can have a participatory um, involvement in how the city is growing and, and how the resources are being distributed. So for us at the World Bank, it was really looking at a very um, comprehensive framework of what sustainability meant and what could we do going forward as these emerging and secondary cities are coming to make sure that they don't lock themselves into trajectories which are unsustainable, which are you know, infrastructure intensive or sprawl intensive or automotive led. Um, and so, so that's where we are and that's what guides our work. And you know, in, I mean, if we look at what are the, some of the largest impacts we've had, I would like to mention um, China, where by 2030 a billion people will be living in cities. Today we already know the smog levels in Beijing and Shanghai and Chengdu and so are high. But through our policy dialogue, you know, we've uh, together with the government of China, we worked on how do we make Chinese cities low carbon. Similarly for South Asia, you know, huge industrialization, manufacturing, we're still in that part, you know, we haven't moved to services and, and, and higher level um, 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 jobs or, um, uh, you know, we are really looking at how are we using water, what are we doing with wastewater, what is, you know, how are we reducing consumption, what are we doing, are we using um, energy from, from solid waste, landfills, and so on. So just, just really focusing on a more resource efficient uh, but inclusive growth, uh, which is led by cities. Tim, <clears throat> carbon emissions, traffic, uh, public administration, energy efficiency. Uh, what's the role of technology in all those things? Well, good morning and thank you, Chris. I think, um, as has been pointed out, technology is a key component of, of creating a sustainable environment in our urban planet, you know, our quickly urbanizing planet. And uh, we feel that, you know, as, as much as we can adapt our solutions to address these issues, we will remain critically important to the development of, of, of these uh, important uh, urban centers. Um, 
we see, you know, sort of at its foundation, data as the new natural resource. Data, as, as, as Abba has mentioned, is all around us. It's generated through our smartphones, uh, the ubiquity of mobile technology, even in the emerging markets. Uh, areas that I focus on in Sub-Saharan Africa have over 70 percent um, penetration of mobile technology. Well, with that comes a lot of data. Well, how do you mine that data, data harvest that data, use that data to leapfrog uh, 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 hard lines, et cetera, and make sense of it? And I think, Chris, that, you know, one can do that um, to have a, a favorable impact on things like traffic congestion, on things like building grids or water, water networks that are more effective and efficient. Um, I think that the uh, use of technology, I think, is, is while it's, it's, it's talked about in these fora, I, I don't think it's fully appreciated uh, uh, or completely understood uh, what we can do with all this information. So I think the technology, uh, sector has a big role to play in this discussion. I, I think while we have uh, learnings to do, especially in the emer emerging markets, we have solutions to bring to bear that can really uh, increase efficiencies and uh, uh, enhance the effectiveness of projects. So um, I think there's a big role to play in, in this conversation is one that very much is interesting to, to, to IBM. IBM has looked at this and, and as some of you have seen our, our uh, literature on this, is, is smarter, smarter cities, and it's not just IBM, there's, a, there's friends of mine in, in, in the uh, audience today from other organizations, tech, tech firms, that have also called this smart technologies. And, and, and I'll, this will be my last comment, uh, is that the way that we look at it for a, a technology corporate uh, uh, point of view is that we say that if we have uh, uh, instrumented uh, 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 infrastructure, if we are able to interconnect that infrastructure, and if we are able to bring smart technologies, intelligent technologies around that, we define that as a smarter intervention. Instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent. So applying analytics to information data, this new, this new natural resource that's emerging, uh, you know, in piles, uh, we're able to cr help create a, a smarter solution that can help leapfrog some of the challenges uh, cities are facing. We only have an hour, and I want to get a round of questions here and then open it up for the uh, audience. But let me go back to you, Michael, and talk a little bit about the technology aspect and also the private sector. You, you made a uh, rather uh, damning remark about multinationals. But what is the role of the <laughs> private sector uh, in these situations beyond uh, their rapacious intent to uh, uh, suppress? On nation states. Let me, let me dodge that one. I'm, we're, we're, <laughs> we're obviously we're, being ironic. We're, we're at the end of history, you know. The, yeah. You know, the, um, but but let me talk a little bit about technology, um, which, which interests me greatly in, in my own work and research. Um, it used to be that instead of talking about what is now called smart technology, um, environmentalists and others talked about appropriate technology. Um, which I still think is a, is a somewhat more lucid descriptor. And the, the, the reason that I want to talk about appropriate technology is that, um, you know, here's a, here's a private sector metaphor, is, is that, that, that I think when we approach questions of solving urban problems, um, we always have to begin on the demand side of the equation rather than on the supply side. And there are a lot of people who are eager to supply technologies that are unnecessary. So, for example, in architectural practice, when you think about how you make a building sustainable, um, your reflexive response should be to think about its orientation, to think about to being able to open the window for cross ventilation, perhaps building low to avoid the expense of an elevator. Um, but these are very simple technologies, um, which should be the default, rather than thinking about elaborate, elaborately sealed buildings in which you can't open the window, you know, there are sensors everywhere, I have no doubt. Um, but this is not necessarily the most appropriate or economical technology. Um, the, sa the same, you know, and, and it's also true that whenever I hear the phrase data mining, you know, in the post-Snowden era, um, it makes me a little nervous. I mean, we want our cities smart, but we don't want them to know everything. 
So um, this is a, a little note of caution. So the, the same is true of traffic, which is one of the, the major applications of smart technology. And obviously, to s increase traffic flow, good to have sensors embedded in the road. You know, the lights are coordinated. Uh, you know, we, we maximize the capacity of existing roadways. On the other hand, um, if you are looking at a demand side solution, um, if your office turns out to be in your neighborhood um, and you can simply walk there, um, then the necessity for all these technologies um, becomes uh, less stringent. So always begin on the demand side. And finally, um, you know, one of, one of the interesting things that's happening in traffic management, and you know, we're, we're in the, 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 at the point in the big study that we're doing about New York City of, of um, looking, looking at um, one of the, the concepts of the day is called shared streets. So um, this is the, the, the product of the imagination of a, 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 a Dutchman. Uh, they call them Woonerf in, in Holland. And the idea basically there is that rather than technologizing the street system, you radically detechnologize it. So there are a thousand streets in Holland in which all the street signs are gone, the traffic lights are gone, the demarcation between this kind of the traditional laminated street in which there's something reserved for pedestrians, something for bikes, something for roller skates, something for trolley cars, something for bus. Every, everybody is sharing the space. Uh, so th this is a de-technologized solution. Um, you know, that, that, com that comes by um, uh, instigating a set of behavioral changes, um, not, not in a kind of reflexive uh, Pavlovian, you know, red light, green light way, um, but in instilling a sense of um, cooperation among citizens that solves the problem without the necessary introduction of high technology. So technology, great, has, it ha has its place, um, but you know, m my argument is that if we're going to be truly sustainable, um, the simplest solutions have to be the default, and in 90% of the cases, they work. I just want to get back to you, but I just want to give Tim a chance to talk a little bit of, I know some of the other, I mean, if you want to respond, but also some of the other things that I know IBM is doing in terms of uh, letting people know about uh, incoming storms and, and at-risk favelas and so on, and how that's also been used in a very simple way to avoid some of this. I think that's right. Let me just say on the role of, of the private sector a little bit in this conversation. I think um, that that was addressed here. And, um, uh, you know, foreign direct investment far surpass, surpasses ODA um, in, in emerging markets. And um, I refer to one study I saw recently from Booz Allen Hamilton that said, Infrastructure investments over the worldwide over the next 30 years are going to be $350 trillion. You know, bottom line is there's an enormous uh, investments in the coming years to, in infrastructure to deal with this push into the urban setting. You know, do we want to build uh, uh, new dumb systems or do we want to build new smart systems? I, I think we would agree that, you know, uh, we want to make these systems as efficient as we can. And it's going to have to be, it's, a lot of this isn't going to come, uh, this investment is not, <laughs> the majority, the vast majority is not going to come from from either uh, ODA or um, uh, and so much of it is going to come from FDI. I've seen the number in, in Africa, again, is 8 to 1, uh, FDI to, to ODA as far as investment goes. So the private sector, I think it's widely accepted, is going to be a partner in, in, in this and um, is, is critical to the sustainability uh, of this enterprise. Um, as far as, uh, you know, where we've engaged, uh, that uh, one, one pretty high profile uh, engagement that I think is, is covered in, in this edition of AQ was, was our, in, our intervention, our cooperation with the city of Rio. Um, uh, they, they had suffered uh, a number of, of real serious and tragic uh, uh, landslides, uh, 2010, 11, 12, that uh, they were looking to uh, uh, respond more rapidly, predict more accurately, and so we uh, in, engaged in a project that is now known as the uh, Integrated Operations Center there. And this was all brought together as well in anticipation of the, the big sporting events they have upcoming in Rio. And now they, they uh, with cooperation from IBM, have a, a center in Rio that can very much accurately predict weather, uh, can help uh, the uh, various uh, components of the government, emergency response, uh, well, meteorology, uh, uh, public safety functions, speak with one another and, and respond on a fact-based um, 
uh, a basis. And a, and a lot of, of, of how technology, I think, uh, can really add value in this is really, you know, help uh, policymakers, decision makers make these critical decisions on, on fact, on metrics. And, and um, so I think Good. I'll just leave it at that. Alyssa, I want to get back to you. Two things. One is you mentioned how funding is the Achilles heel uh, for a lot of these projects. So give us a sense of how uh, municipal governments are addressing this issue of funding. Um, and then another question which you raised very effectively in your article is how um, you make sure that there's policy continuity uh, in these uh, areas across administrations. It's something we're obviously uh, confronting in the New York City where I live uh, with the Bloomberg administration. So. Obviously, in both cases, funding is key. Not, not, not very effectively. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, particularly the municipalities that we deal with, intermediate cities, uh, have in average uh, a credit rating of uh, double B or triple B at the local level, uh, which means that their access to, to financing is very limited. So for any given mayor, uh, the most efficient use of his time is to queue in the capital in front of the minister's office or the president of the development, local development bank, or whatever, to try to get uh, some some assistance. Th that is a real uh, Achilles heel. I mean, even when we think about private sector, which, by the way, uh, in our program, private sector has a, a very important role. I mean, uh, sometimes as just local stakeholders. Uh, Fundación FEMSA Coca-Cola in Mexico uh, is a partner with us in La Paz, and recently, uh, Fiat, who's building the largest car manufacturing plant uh, in the world uh, 20 miles outside of Recife came here to talk to us to see if they could you know, join the program. No? Uh, even in the private sector, even when you think about financing via the private sector and you think about public-private partnerships for these municipalities, sometimes with a credit rating of double B or triple B, you want to build, let's say, a water treatment plant or a sewage plant, and you promise them an offtake promise of 20 years to pay X amount of pesos or quetzales or what have you for the water that has been treated, well, that 20 year contract from a double B or triple B credit rated municipality is worth nothing for a bank. So, you know, then you have to queue in line and get a guarantee from the federal government. So, that is a, in reality a, a, a big, big issue. And, and I mean, we spend a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to, to, to solve that. Uh, in terms of the, the, the second question, mm -hmm. what we're seeing is. Uh, Obviously, in political regimes where there is uh, the possibility of re-election in mayors, uh, we actually work better, no? because a lot of times uh, the mayor almost uh, endorses our program as its platform uh, for continuity and for political re-election. And, and obviously, if the results are there and he starts having an impact, that obviously helps him or her. In countries where there's not, um, a, when there's not re-election, which are you know major countries like Mexico or Colombia, no, a, we have a bit of a challenge. And what we're doing there is invest more resources, more time in trying to build the citizen monitoring capacity. No, we actually have an agreement with what probably is one of the largest uh, NGOs uh, in Latin America with uh, hands-on experience in this. Uh, in this business, which is uh, the city of Bogota. Bogota has been for 20 years having a, a citizen monitoring system. In Bogota, como vamos? Bogota, how we're doing? And we have an agreement with them, and they're helping us in, in eight of our 30 cities in the program. No? Uh, other than that is, and, and the use of technology, by the way, I think the use of technology is going to help us a lot. The more citizens can be involved in almost online, in, in direct participation, in, in making sure that, you know, they agree or disagree with a particular policy. It's going to be like you know public policy uh, on citizen participation online. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Last, in the World Bank, um, what are you doing in terms of fostering? Uh, or what have you been doing in terms of fostering information sharing, uh, experience, learning from across uh, different regions? Actually, I'm really glad that you that you brought that up because that's my <laughs> current role on, uh, on knowledge exchange and learning. And I think, I mean, what we've really seen is that, um, you know, cities learn from other cities. You can't just go and, and say to them that, you know, this is what would work or so on. They, they want to see how it has worked in another city and they want to meet with the mayor and they want to meet with the planners yeah. and do that. And as uh, 
um, I think there's a really lovely term for it. It's called uh, 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 a cloud of trust. Because you, know, you, you are in the same situation as, as I am. So you know, we actually have a, um, a very um, um, strong uh, program in terms of um, city to city learning, in terms of um, peer to peer learning. And we also do that through uh, what we call South-South Knowledge Exchange. So basically, it's a matter of, for example, you know, Abessa um, in Rio is a fantastic water utility, and it's actually you know, far ahead of other water utilities in similar cities all over the world. So we, you know, we would definitely get other cities to, to come there and, and, and learn from Abessa how, how they've managed this utility and, and how they run it. Similarly, you know, it's, uh, um, it's, it's the transport system in Nigeria, the urban transport system. And that's something that other cities want to learn from. So we are always looking at, you know, how do we do peer-to-peer um, -peer learning, how do we do um, knowledge exchange um, so that you know, cities learn from each other and move on. And I think it's worked really, really well uh, in terms of energy efficiency initiatives and, and city leadership initiatives and, and also um, transit-oriented development. You know, we all know about you know, Kuchiba and Bogota and so on, and, and our cities have learned from, um, from each other in that sense. I also wanted to take a very quick uh, um, sort of um, intervention on, on, on the role of private sector. And, and I do believe, you know, given that we have close to, you know, if you just look at the cities, there's almost a trillion dollars of infrastructure investment required every year uh, just to meet the demands of the citizens. There is no way that the public sector can meet this. And as, um, as Alice explained, you know, the cities are, they have no resources. There's no revenue base. The intergovernmental fiscal um, um, transfers are, are not robust and, and they are not dependable. So one area that we're looking at is, you know, how do we bring municipalities to a level where they are actually able to, to attract private sector? You know, how do you get them? Even something as simple as into double, um, um, uh, double system account keeping and making sure that their, their books are balanced so that if nothing else, they can at least um, actually uh, access the local capital markets. Only 4% of the 500 biggest cities in, in the developing world actually can access international capital markets. So, so that's something that, that I wanted to bring, that public-private partnerships are going to be so important. And one last line on data, and I love to quote Mayor Bloomberg on this. You know, there are two, two quotes. He says, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And the second thing he said was that in God we trust, but for everything else, give us data. So cities need data. You know, if you can show that there are 800 households which access just one water pump in a favela, that is more powerful for a mayor to make a change than anything else. But you have to be able to record it and measure it and demonstrate it. So, um, you know, I'm all for data, and I think public private partnerships are very, very important. Let's open it up for questions. Uh, we're very patient. Uh, we start a little late, so we can take it maybe one slightly over. Uh, questions from the audience? The microphones are there. Uh, Mike McDonald, over the last uh, 10, 12 years, we've been running a global resilience system going into the big disaster areas. Um, thank you very much. It's a very rich discussion so far. I just want to throw out a couple of thoughts uh, that may provide a different perspective. Um, we know that at 350 parts per million, we're actually beginning to melt the pole, uh, the North Pole, uh, the North, uh, the, the Arctic region. And um, we're now over 400 parts per million. Uh, this year, we melted twice as much of the methane hydrates as we did last year. So that is thought to be the end game meaning when you start releasing methane from the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, then we are way above where we need to be in terms of, of pollution. Um, what happens if we actually have to shift to a post-petrochemical uh, political economy almost immediately? Let's, let's be graceful and say in five years, maybe 10 years, but uh, the international Energy Agency says that unless we do it by 2017, we are already into the end game. 
So I'm hearing from Michael already an awareness that uh, this has to happen, but I'm not sure your time frame may be immediate en enough. And what I'm hearing from uh, the rest of the group is perhaps the political economy that you're suggesting in this massive urbanization is actually driving huge increase in a petrochemical political economy at a time when we have to be going the other way. Let me take a set of questions. It's a very good one. Uh, and I want to add one on that, just if I uh, can. As, as Ellis mentions in his article, 73% of the population in the Americas lives in low-lying areas around bodies of water. Let me take the next question, and we'll answer them all at the same time. Good morning. Buenos dias. I'm Kristen Schultz, Independent. I'm curious about the social factor and the social participation. Ellis Juan and Michael Sorkin both spoke about the community participation. Um, and I wanted to hear more about that. I was curious about, Michael Sorkin, you spoke about these opportunities to find solutions that are through human collaboration and behavior change. I, I love that concept, but behavior change doesn't always come so easily. So I'd like to hear more about programs, policies, um, even products that are helping engage citizens through the private sector um, that are helping really achieve that engagement um, in a very effective way. I'd like to see those examples, if you have any that you can point to. Very nice. Another one? Go ahead. Good morning. Larry Sperling with the uh, State Department's Office of Global Partnerships. Um, I really appreciate everybody's comments on public-private partnerships and on the role of the private sector. My question is this. Um, uh, uh, philanthropy and corporate social responsibility programs are, are important and, and all well and good, but at the end of the day, uh, private companies want to see a return on investment and, and want to understand the value proposition of, of engaging uh, in, in, in answering the call. Uh, so, so the question is, um, uh, how, uh, how, do, how do we, all of us interested in engaging more private sector participation, um, articulate that value proposition in, in this context? Uh, what, what is the opportunity for return on investment in, in um, uh, engaging and helping cities, which as uh, 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 someone pointed out, don't, don't have large budgets to uh, contract for services. Is there anyone else? Okay, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna have Tim answer first. We'll like to go in reverse order uh, with Ellis answering last. And so this is, uh, we're, he's hosting us, so we wanna make sure that he gets the final word. <coughs> Tim. Well, thank you, and I'll try to be brief to give my colleagues time also to respond, and I'll sort of cherry pick uh, issues that sort of resonate. Um, you know, on this question of resiliency, uh, we're well aware of uh, the movement to create hardened infrastructure, and we're being uh, asked to uh, come in and work for clients in the public sector around these issues. You know, how do we harden our infrastructure? How do we do it in a way that is smart, sustainable? and affordable. And so we're very much engaged in that space. Um, and, and, and let me jump then to the, to the last question as well, and I'll speak a little bit more on it. Um, this notion of <clears throat> PPPs, uh, uh, of course, the, the need for return, uh, business case, uh, business models associated with these that are attractive to the private sector. You know, um, there's a lot of discussion these days about shared value. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of that. It's a pretty simple concept. It's um, you know, while, while corporations must do well, uh, a lot of corporations also want to do good. And when you can bring these things together in a shared value sort of proposition, um, from my point of view, from, uh, you know, from our work, I, th I think those are the solutions that are most appealing and most sustainable. Um, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that, Chris. Okay. <coughs> so, my quick First on, first on public-private partnerships, you know, I agree that they need a return on investment, but also remember that right now it is, you know, with the burgeoning middle class in Asia, in Africa, in China, um, and East Asia, uh, you have huge markets there, and, and that's, that's where, you know, the private sector is moving. But you can't have those markets unless, you know, the, the cities are sustainable, unless there's proper infrastructure, and I don't think we can go in terms of grow today and clean up later. 
So that is not an option. And I think, you know, uh, nobody is really looking for philanthropy, but we are looking for, you know, corporate social responsibility. And, and there are ways for the private sector to go through PPPs and, and finance infrastructure and, and other services. Um, and um, I think it's, it's, it's also really important to know that PPPs are not a panacea for anything. It's the way they are structured is how the risk is distributed. And um, it's, it's just a way of getting efficiency. It's not really a way of getting risk-free capital. So I think we, you know, we understand all of that. But the private sector uh, investments will move to the developing countries because that is where the biggest consumption and the biggest needs are. In terms of um, community participation and social participation, um, I wanted to um, add a little bit, you know, for examples like participatory budgeting, which actually started in Latin America, where the citizens actually give feedback, uh, not just feedback, but a sense of where do they need a certain percentage of the city's budget to be invested? Is it in, um, is it in housing in their areas? Is it, is it in sanitation, water, and so on? And I, th I think that's a very, very powerful tool um, to guide investments um, in a city. And of course, um, you know, citizen feedback on everything has become a, a very, very large part of the way that, um, that cities are, are working and responding to the needs of their citizens. Your, 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 first, your first point about working in secondary cities. Um, a million people added to the urban population every week, and it's not just secondary cities, it's new cities um, that, that are of some urgency. Um, so in answer to the first two questions about the imminence of global warming and what can we do, um, one slightly counterintuitive fact, which is that New York City um, is, by some estimates, the second most energy efficient city in the United States. This seems completely counterintuitive. Um, but it has to do with only one thing, which is a piece of infrastructure that we have in New York that other cities don't, which is an efficient underground system of public transportation. Um, this makes a tremendous difference. So in a sense, the answer to the question, you know, and I, I support the, the idea of the urgency, um, uh, is the city. And I think that's something that everybody on this panel probably agrees, is that cities are incredibly or potentially incredibly efficient engines um, for sustainability. So to make intelligent, smart, sustainable cities, I think, is a big part of the answer to the crisis that we have to address. Mm, get to the public-private thing. So I have a dual life. You know, I am, a, I, I am an unsuccessful entrepreneur um, dealing with uh, large-scale projects in China where, you know, you get to see capitalism circa 1600. Uh, and, and I run an NGO. And, um, you know, I, I'm here to beg for support. Uh, we do research on sustainability. Um, and um, I, yeah, the, the other, I, I point out that this issue is largely about public leadership in terms of facilitating <laughs> environmental transformation with the private sector, presumably. Um, and I am somebody who wants to strongly support the idea that we must have a vigorous, strong, and democratic public sector in order to lead. Um, let's not be distracted by um, too much talk about profit. Um, the profit will come, but um, it is the public sector that, that represents us and is responsible for planning. And um, I would encourage a more vigorous public sector. You know, the sainted Bloomberg is gone, but now we have Bill de Blasio who's going to give us pre-K education by raising taxes. Um, and I'm, I'm all right with that. Um, but I, th I think the real question about the public-private sector partnership uh, possibility for profit is whose private sector is going to um, uh, succeed uh, and profit from this series of initiatives that are, we all acknowledge are vital to us all. If I had longer, I would give you my brief disquisition about why we need to start talking about um, import substitution economics again at the, at the urban scale. Very vigorous discussion in Latin America, some success some, you know, so, some time ago. But I am, I am arguing in terms of the relationship of public and private that it is, a, it is the duty of the public to build local capacity. That's why the increment of the, the city is so important. And that's, you know, any throwaway remark about the multinationals, forgive me. Um, but I do think it is the duty of governments to see um, that success in the private sector occurs at the local level. The last anecdote is, is I was in Medellin, uh, fantastic, you know, the, 
amazing, pub, largely public sector transformative project. I met Fajardo, mm -hmm. and I said, um, don't you think it would be good if you could be reelected? If you, you had this system? And he said, no, 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 it's, it's much better this way because what happens is you lose three honest mayors, but you get rid of a thousand corrupt ones. So. <laughs> okay, given time constraints, I will only address the first question, the one on global warming and, and climate change. No? Uh, personally, I agree with most of the things you said. <clears throat> Institutionally, we have taken a sort of a better a pragmatic approach in our program to this, which might not please everybody. But in essence, Latin America is responsible for about eight to nine percent of the global emissions, give or take. Now, in terms of impact of natural disasters, we have two thirds of our cities are cities that are located near great masses of water, whether coastal cities or cities by river beds or lakes. There are three factors that are particularly very, very important uh, for us. Uh, sea level rise, pluviosity, uh, uh, flooding, and hurricanes. In, in the little numbers we've done, uh, every time one of these cities get hit by, by, um, by a natural disaster, and we use the example of Villahermosa, which is the capital of Tabasco, the, the oil capital of Mexico, they suffer 2006, 2008, and 2009. Uh, every time uh, something happened, it was mostly flooding, and they're, they're seen by uh, Rio Grijalva, which is one of the largest rivers in, in Mexico. The local GDP loses between eight to 12 percent, not counting losses of human lives, of course. So imagine, I mean, we all have this uh, very recent from the global financial crisis of 2007 and eight. Uh, it takes you four years <laughs> to get back to that position. No? So the approach we're taking is we are in our program, we're putting a lot more impact on adaptation. We're trying to help more the local governments develop their capacities, uh, resilient infrastructure, and so on. One of the things we're finding out is that most of the reaction capacity in Latin America to national disasters is centralized at the capital level, at the federal level. That's why it takes 24 hours to get you know, someone when the disaster hits. So, so we're putting the emphasis there. Now, in terms of mitigation, just to close the argument, in Latin America, energy is responsible for 70% of, of the regional emissions, and within this, probably half is related to transport. One of the things we're learning in intermediate cities, you know, we're working with Gale Architects, which is a, a, a Danish firm, pioneering this business of you know, rescuing public space. They did a lot of beautiful work in, in Times Square in New York. And one of the things we're starting to, to understand and comprehend is that in some of these intermediate cities, it doesn't matter how a smart technology we can develop for transit, it's just getting to the level where there's just no space for more cars. <laughs> there's just no space for more cars. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, what you do there. Even if you do a subway, which obviously intermediate cities don't have the cash for that, but even if you do a subway to get to the subway, there's just no way we can we can absorb more cars. We have the city of Jalapa, for instance. It's a city of half a million people in Mexico, but it's already converted, you know, integrated with another seven municipalities. So a million people go to Jalapa every day. It's impossible. You cannot move. You just can't move. And, and, and you know, it doesn't matter how many sensors you put there, how many things you measure, how many data you have of the cars that are coming. It's just the city is blocked. So we're starting to think, I mean, how can we get this debate of, of the car versus the citizen? Uh, how do we share this, this public space, which today is 80% cars, 15, 20% uh, in, uh, people, no? How, how can we get this debate a little more uh, forward? And we're going to have a test now on June the 5th when we, when we meet in the city of La Paz with the city council, no? But uh, again, uh, agree, but we're focusing a lot more on adaptation now. I want to thank uh, Gustavo <laughs> to, for opening up our, our, our conversations. I want to thank our panelists. I mean, I learned uh, so much from them. I want to thank Chris. You were excellent, great. And I want to particularly thank Andreina for coming up with this idea and for helping us really organizing and coordinating this event. Thank you all for coming. Huh? Have a good day. Thank you.
Very good. Very good question.